Hey, I'm Steve Gambiel, the lead pastor at Life Church, and I'm so glad we have this time together. It is so important to stir up hope and life and empowerment and equip people to make a difference today. That's what we're all about here at Life Church. So as we listen to today's message, I really hope it impacts you and inspires you to make a difference in your world. saved for the grace of Jesus. I mean, for what God has done in our lives. And, and what we feel and what we experience is so difficult to communicate. So yes, I feel like Buddy the Elf when I begin to describe my experience about Jesus. And there's so many people who don't understand that Jesus is not a baby anymore. He's risen and resurrected. He's the healing Jesus. He's the providing Jesus. He's the Jesus who's with us right now. And so this enthusiasm is so much deeper than just getting excited. This is an ever-present reality that he is Emmanuel. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now, the reason why I think we don't always get excited and understand who Jesus is, because when we go through challenges, our life looks very ordinary. And I want to talk to ordinary people who feel like me, who have ordinary challenges and things that we go through that are almost mundane and boring. Sometimes I get bored by my own life. Can you just say amen? Is there anybody here who's just bored by their own life? Bored by what you go through Monday morning, Tuesday morning? Bored with their routine? I'm not saying we devalue people in any way, but, but there's this lack of expectancy as we go through life together. Well, I wanted to just open this up and go to the old familiar story in Luke chapter 2. Yeah, just the old familiar story about Jesus. It's just Jesus. Here we go again, the Christmas story. Oh, I knew what would happen. We're coming to live church and they're talking about Christmas. See, it's just ordinary. We have a way, a way of, just, of, of just not understanding. And so, so I want us to just look afresh at Luke chapter 2. I'm going to set the scene for you. The angel of the Lord appears to shepherds living out in the fields. Now, this sounds really strange to me. Why? Would God choose a bunch of shepherds in the back side of a desert somewhere on a hillside and send an angel to make an announcement about the Messiah? And this is what the angel said. He said, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. Now, that's the setting. That's the setting that we're describing this is such an ordinary setting. And, you know, and I ask myself this question. If I was God, would I choose a bunch of shepherds to be the eyewitnesses for the coming of the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Ordinary people, ordinary, average ordinary shepherds. You know, I would probably think, okay, who's got the most influence? Who's got the most wealth? Who's got the most economic power that's, that's, that's around? And choose Jesus to be born from that person so that we could have a strategic plan to let the world know the Messiah has come, but not God. And when I look at the setting for this, I realize God loves the setting called ordinary. He loves ordinary people. He loves ordinary people like you and I. And so I understand that now. I understand this setting called ordinary. That's our context. Because look at what God did. God entrusted Jesus to very ordinary people, Joseph and Mary. We all know the Joseph and Mary story from this end. And we all see, you know, the divine Mary and all the rest of it. But let's just get real. This is Joe. He was a carpenter. Come on, somebody. If you're in Bradford, he'd be called Joe the carpenter. Joe the carpenter fancy some chick down the road, kind of like me in Dewsbury when I fancied Charlotte, that beautiful girl that I'm married to now. He fancies, you know, fancies her, wants to date her. And so he proposes and she says yes and they plan the wedding. And then Mary walks up to old Joe and says, Joe, I got a little thing I got to tell you about. And Joe's like, okay, what is it, sweetheart? And she's like, well, I'm pregnant. Joe's thinking I got a saw in my toolkit and I got a hammer. I'm going to go kill that person who got you pregnant. Come on. And Joe's like, who's the girl? And, and, and she's like, no, no, no. It was an immaculate conception. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, right. A what? An immaculate conception. And old Joe's like, an immaculate conception? No way. I know some of my boys, some of my friends that I run with, they fancied you, don't they? And they've done something behind your back. I mean, 
I imagine the conversation. And Joe, in a very ordinary day, he, he has to make a decision. He has to make a decision to realize something extraordinary has just happened to good old Mary that I've grown up with. And I realized this, that in our average ordinary setting of life, whatever we go through, it's the setting that makes the sign miraculous. The setting of ordinary means simply this, that God is an extraordinary God who loves you with an extraordinary love. He loves you in a way that's so complete and so extravagant and so mind-blowing. He loves you in a way that's so complete that it blows your mind Ordinary people like you and me, but we're loved in an extraordinary way by Jesus, a risen, wrecked, ascended Lord. I mean, I, I just, I get so excited when I think about this. And then I realize this. I realize that we might feel very ordinary. The way we communicate, the way I communicate, the way I speak, we might feel very ordinary. But it's not the ordinary words we use. You see, we might feel very ordinary, but our message is miraculous. Our message has power. Our message is the gospel. And just the other day, I, I heard a story from someone in our church here, and I, I and I've been they've been telling me I've been they've been sharing their faith with somebody, and they shared their faith with someone who was selling a big issue. And they found out in sharing their faith that the woman who was selling big issues had just had a baby. And the baby girl had two holes in her heart. And the doctors didn't think that the baby would live. And so a very ordinary day in a shopping center, one of the saints in her house, just an average ordinary, put, her, put his hand on this girl's shoulder and said, I'm praying for your baby. The next week he goes back into the same shopping center where the girl was selling big issues. And the woman ran up to him and hugged him and said, you won't believe it, you won't believe it, you won't believe what happened. And he says, what? Barely remembering the prayer. He said, the doctors have said, my baby is healed. The holes in the heart are gone. And now she's going to get released from the hospital. You see, just the average ordinary setting in the day was surrounding us. We might feel very ordinary, but our message is so powerful. And if we can find the confidence and the boldness to share our message, then things will change. And, and so this setting and this sign I wanted to talk to you about is so important because in our ordinary setting of life, in our jobs and in our families, we have a miraculous message. And, and, and I'm going to take this into verse 13 because this is where this lands and this is where my message starts really in Luke chapter 2, verse 13. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven. And on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. So you get the picture. One angel announced that Jesus was born. Although, of course, at that time, when they, they said that the Messiah has come, the name Jesus hadn't even been given yet. Because the name Jesus wasn't given until the eighth day that the baby was born. So, so they're announcing something people don't understand. And all of this huge angelic choir. But another Bible version says this. It's an army. An army of angels appears. I mean, you imagine this scene. You're just a shepherd with a couple of buddies, and you're out on a hillside. One angel shows up and announces the Messiah has come. And then suddenly, the skies are filled with the thunderous sound of angels. The army of the Lord announcing and singing, glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. His favor is, rests on you and I. His favor rests on average, ordinary people. And, you know, of course it means here, that word favor means well-pleased. I don't think we understand this enough. I don't think we have a greatest, we need a greater revelation of this. That we understand that God is well-pleased with us. He's not condemning you. He's not judging you. He's pleased with you. He loves your effort. He loves it when you try and stumble and you make a mistake and you pick yourself up and you try again. He's up there applauding and saying, that's my son. That's my daughter. That's my family. That's my church. That's the God that we serve. Of course, but we're trained in a culture to say that if we don't succeed the first time, we should just give up and quit. That's not what God says. God says he's well pleased with you. You see, when, when someone is well pleased with you, you find the strength to try again. And if we think that God wants to judge us, we won't try again. We live in a society today where they don't realize how good God is. 
See, people are confused by this. The great writer C.S. Lewis, he described the challenges today. He talked about how many people, and he wrote, he wrote like 50 years ago, but we know him today by the Lion, the Witch, and the Road Urban, the Chronicles of Narnia. But he was a great theologian, great thinker. And he wrote, many people today think that good and evil exist on the same plane. He called it dualism, and many philosophers have talked about this, that we think that evil and good fight it out on planet Earth. That we fight it out so we have a good day and a bad day. We have bad things happen and good things happen. Well, that happens sometimes in our setting of an experience, but let's not approach God like that. Because the devil is not at the same plane as Jesus. They don't coexist. They're not equal, okay? We've got to understand this. The devil's armies, the devil's power, the devil's minions, whatever you want to think about them theologically, are nothing compared to the resurrected power of Jesus Christ. We do not live in a world where we have dualism. No, the Bible teaches us that we have no rival, we have no equal because of who Jesus is. His coming announced a whole new era, thunderous praise. You know, thunderous praise of angels. But the truth is, we can wake up and just think life is so ordinary and so average that we don't understand how powerful it is to be able to have access to Jesus. You have access to Jesus. Touch the person next to you. You have access. Come on, if there's no one around you, we're going to fill this place. Come on, who's up for me with this? We're going to fill this place with people who need the grace of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness, the love, the power of Jesus. In an ordinary place like good old Bradford, this is how we roll. A suddenly, a suddenly happened one day when I was in a drum lesson and I didn't know who Jesus was and someone stepped up and told me who Jesus was. A suddenly happened one day in my life when I applied for a job and I actually got a job. Has anybody had a job this year that you didn't have last year and you're grateful for what he's doing? It suddenly happens when someone that you barely know puts an arm around you and prays a prayer of faith. And then a couple weeks later, you get the doctor's report where you're all clear. Because now, after believing God for a long time, a suddenly happened. And a suddenly is about to happen for someone in this congregation right now. Please, with our efforts that we often look at and think, oh, this is so ordinary. So ordinary are our efforts. But here's the truth. The Bible is so clear about it. It says that God's eyes are roaming over all the world to find people whose hearts are fully committed to him. When God finds people whose hearts are fully committed to him, then the power of transformation can take place. And you know, just this sense of church family that we share, the belonging that we have together that makes this life church is something that is so miraculous. Something that can be often so overlooked, but we have to recognize that being a part of a spiritual family is one of the greatest gifts that Jesus created when he created the church. He created the church not just to survive, but to extend his love and his power to the ends of the earth. He didn't choose to do that through an individual, but through all of the different gifts and talents, all of the different kinds of people and all the different kind of varieties of life that we come from. And so really when we look at this favor, this fact that God is well pleased, I wanted to clarify this because this Savior that we have, this Savior is so miraculous and yet people look at your life and my life and they say, ah, oh, it's just Steve, or oh, it's just Mary, or oh, it's just Tim. What do they say about you? You have to realize, no, we might be normal, we might be average, but the point is this, our Savior is not average. And when people say to you, it's just Jesus, oh, it's just Jesus, it's just another Sunday at Life Church. yeah, put your head back and say, yep, it's just Jesus. It's just Jesus who saved my marriage, it's just Jesus who's going to be there for my children as they grow up. It's just Jesus who's going to rescue my neighborhood. It's just Jesus who's giving me that entrepreneurial idea to pioneer in 2018 a whole new realm of thinking. It's just like Jesus to use ordinary people like us to show an extraordinary sign to the UK and to the world that Jesus is alive. And right here in the setting of Bradford, God's going to do so much because of who 
he is. Church yesterday was one of the greatest days, I think, and in, 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 I, I just enjoyed it so much. I, I just loved it so much, our Love Your Neighbor Day. I'm so proud of Richie and Stacy Garrett, who just, just did off the charts yesterday, and all the team involved with them. And I just spent time yesterday just sitting and just reading the reports, and I went into the media with Jacques and Jacques Corden, and I just watched all the pictures. Watch pictures of David and Sharon Bass out loving the elderly community. If you don't know David and Sharon, they're amazing in our house. I, I, I was just amazed at all the different things. Our kids' church did something amazing yesterday, not just Beauty and the Beast, but they went into a local primary school and shared the love of Jesus with hundreds of families, like we don't have enough on. And they're out there loving Jesus. We served over 220 meals to the broken and poor in our city yesterday. And on and on it goes in the areas of Allerton and gas and electric provision. I mean, just miraculous what God is doing in our house. But let me just show you just a, just a little bit of the behind the scenes because God does so much more than we will ever see with our natural eyes. That's why the Bible says we have to walk by faith and not by sight. But I wanted to show you this. This is just a little clip of what happened yesterday. Let's enjoy this together. Honestly, I think that's the heartbeat of Jesus. The heartbeat of Jesus. And I know there are many reasons why we say to God, God, you can't use us today. God, we can't do that because we're just, we don't have what it takes. We don't have the resources. We don't have the equipment. But what did Jesus say? He said, no, you have everything you need. You are the spiritual equipment. I wonder what would happen if we as the church stopped praying for God to do miracles. And we just stepped up and decided to be someone else's miracle. I wonder what would happen if we take our focus and instead of turning it upward, God, we need you to do this. We ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, would you help us? Would you help us do something for you? Work through us, Holy Spirit, to do something for someone else. I wonder if over this Christmas season, we would change our focus and change our prayers. And I am convinced if we do this, I am convinced, I am so convinced, I am utterly convinced, we could decide to step up and be the miracle that someone else is waiting for. We can be the hug, we can be the help, we can be the text message, we can be the person that says, you know what, we're going to provide food in your cupboard. You know what, we're going to bless you with a secondhand car that we don't need anymore. We're going to bless it with you. You know, it's like, let's be the miracle. I have decided I'm going to be someone else's miracle. My neighbor, my friend, the school colleague, someone that I, as an acquaintance. It's like, it's like if we step up and make that difference and communicate that, guess what? All the glory is going to go to God. All the glory that God is waiting. He is waiting for a church to wake up and realize her power. That a church stops focusing on petty differences and realize our Savior is alive. Jesus is alive. And our praise joins with the angels. And our life joins in this thunderous applause that Jesus is moving in our generation. You know, as I look at the needy in our community, as I look at the people that are running multi-million pound corporations and yet can hardly sleep at night for anxiety and fear for what 2018 is gonna bring. I think of the peace of God that rests in your heart and I pray as your pastor that boldness and confidence would accompany your peace 
so that you don't despise the day of small beginnings, the day of being ordinary. No, you take pride in the fact that Jesus is your Lord. You take pride not in who you are, but in whose you are. You take pride in the fact that you might have gone through difficulty, but alongside every difficult experience you go through, Jesus Christ is with you in your challenge. And if he's with you in your challenge, he's going to be with you in your resurrection power. Because that's the God that we love and we serve. Come on, Holy Spirit, right now in this place. Would you just help us settle right now? I know we have needs. I know we have challenges. But could it be, Lord, that in the middle of our need and challenge, in the middle of the things that are keeping us up awake at night, that you're still speaking to us about being someone else's miracle? And Jesus, as we step out to serve someone else, would you just take care of us on the way? Would you just take care of whatever challenge and circumstance we're facing because we know you're a good God. We know that you're well pleased with us. There's someone struggling here right now and you're struggling with self-doubt and guilt and condemnation. Well, we're here to say to you, Jesus is well pleased with you. God is well pleased with you. The Holy Spirit wants to comfort you and bring you peace right now in this place. Hey, that's all we have time for now. And as we draw our time together to a close, our prayer and our confidence rests in God, that God is with you. So as you move forward into your week and month ahead, we know that you're gonna go on to make a greater difference in the world. Hey, we just want to take a moment to thank you so much for your friendship, partnership, prayer, and for standing with us on our campuses, through our conferences, and everything we do. We're praying for you. We're so grateful for all of your help and prayer and just keeping an eye on what we're doing. Thank you so much. Yeah, we want to pray blessing over you as you head into a new year, that this Christmas would be a time of refreshing for you, time of joy for you, but you would head into 2018 excited for your future as you've sown into our ministry with yes. prayers and partnering with us through podcasts and other things that you've done. We're praying blessing back on you. We pray strength to you and we pray that the dream in your heart would explode in 2018. We are better together. So thank you.